On the banks of the River Test in Hampshire stands the village of Houghton, a farming community little disturbed by the tide of modern life. In Houghton dwells Mr. Potter, the wheelwright, last in a long line of craftsmen, the epitome of tradition, for all his skills have their roots deep in the past. Today, Mr. Potter and his assistant, Alf, have a commission for a set of trap wheels. And this is not unusual because he is now the only wheelwright in Wessex and there is still a steady trade. Building a wheel begins with the hub, nave or stock, as it was called in the language of the ancient craft. Good English elm, long seasoned, and hands well versed in the art and mystery of wheelwrights, put the two together and traditional curves unfold as chisel bites into wood. When Mr. Potter was apprenticed in the early 1900s, he had to operate this lathe by hand while his father turned these self-same patterns. Each has its function, decoration for the face of the nave, and lands for the stock hoops, iron bonds to reinforce the wood as the spokes are driven home. The wheelwright knows well the feel and fragrance of prime timber and the tactile pleasure of creating a functional object that is also a thing of beauty. In every aspect is the subtle blending of art and science that is the mystery of the craft. How Euclid would have delighted in the stepping compasses and the simple application of geometry to the marking out of the positions of the spokes. more to marking out these mortises than the radial displacement of spokes, for each one is staggered or offset from its neighbour, on and off it is called, forming two rows so as not to weaken the nave. Meanwhile, Alf works straight-grained oak for the spokes, using a draw knife and a spoke shave to save weight whilst conserving strength. Theirs is a peculiar blend of modern and traditional, the hand and the machine, in this case, a mortise chisel. When it comes to the assembly of the wheel, the driving of the spoke feet into the nave, it is the hand which is paramount for it is only the proper coordination of hand with eye which can give a strong and true result. The process is aided by a gauge clamped to the axle hole, like a clock hand, to ensure that each spoke is correctly aligned and with the right degree of dish. has also been handed down from father to son and is a traditional tool of the fraternity of wheelwrights. Simple yet true, it provides the relationship between the inner circle of the nave and the outer, where the rim or sole will be. Mr. Potter can remember the time before they bought their machines when all was made by hand from timber purchased in the log. That went as the machines came in 
and the wheelwright accepted the benefits of the Industrial Revolution unselfconsciously for what they are, aids to his handwork. So tongues are machined onto the spokes with a hollow auger, the correct length to the knock, as it is called, being achieved by the set of the tool. A minute or two later, Mr. Potter picks up another traditional tool, a scratch bit. No better way has been devised to strike the twin arcs, back and bosom, of the rim. The rim pieces, usually of ash, are called fellows, which long usage upon the wheelwright's tongue has corrupted to fellies, and thus, in his parlance, it is fellies that he is making. The ring of the wheel closes as fellies and spokes meet under the guiding force of a shoulder set against the spoke dog and with deft blows of a mallet. The spoke dog is a hooked bar of iron set in a wooden handle with which the spokes are drawn together into the correct position to enter holes already bored in the fellies. It remains only to fix the spoke tongues firmly in the fellies with wedges of heart of oak and so lock the pieces into a perfect circle. And this they do, working together in a harmony born of years. Now the wheel must be shaved, smoothed, primed and putted. And the smith called to measure the circumference with a traveller to establish the length of iron needed for the tyre. High summer in Hampshire and a tiny procession of a master craftsman and a journeyman running a wheel. In the dying fire is the rim of iron, hot and expanded. All is great haste, since every moment that the rim is out of the fire is a second of cooling which could upset the calculations of Mr. Burt the blacksmith who, in making the rim just that much shorter than the circumference, relies upon the expansion to slip the tire over the wheel and its contraction to draw the joints tight into a rigid hole. Water to cool the tire and douse the flames as hot metal sears into dry wood. Water to speed the contraction and draw nave, spokes and fellies together in a vice-tight grip. At this moment, a flaw in the wood or a miscalculation in the making could cause the whole wheel to disintegrate. 